question. Okay, so adverse childhood experiences or the ACE study. So you guys have some knowledge of what the ACE study is. And um, so part of what I was thinking about doing is talking a little bit more about the ACE study and understanding ACE scores. Because in order to be trauma-informed, we have to understand how people are affected by the trauma that has happened to them in their lives. Because ultimately, being trauma-informed is basically having a lens that allows you to say, instead of what is wrong with this person, <laughs> what's happened <laughs> to this person that is causing this type of behavior. Because usually when we can have that sort of that framing of whatever the behavior is or whatever it is that's going on, then we can have more compassion and we can react and act in a different way towards and with that, that person. So it's just really helpful to have the information about ACEs. And then I always expand because really, ultimately, the average childhood experiences study is very limited in terms of what can be traumatic in the individual. And it left out a huge area, which is trauma of oppression. Um, so we're, we can talk a little bit about that, we can expand on ACEs, and um, then talk about resilience, because what we don't want to do is just talk about bad stuff, and not acknowledge that there's also powerful, positive things in our lives and in the lives of the people that we work with, in your case, I guess, the littles. <laughs> I like that. Um, and sometimes it's, an, it's not so much of an issue of creating new positive things, but sort of bringing more life into what's there that is positive, and then learning how taking how we get the full effect of that. And ultimately, that has to do with how we pay attention to it. So there's some things that are really simple um, bits of information that, when applied, can make a huge, huge difference in um, how we show up in the world, and, and ultimately in how um, adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress and trauma affect us throughout our lifespan. So, um, I'm not sure why my slides aren't up here. Do you know what I need to do to make it this way? Once you learn about ACEs, you say, what do we do now? Now that we know about trauma, now that we understand that the, this has a profound effect on folks that are in the midst of it and then along the rest of the lifespan, what can we do besides make a referral? Because that's ultimately what we're taught to do, is, especially in my uh, in my arena. It's like, okay, who's gonna, where do we find the therapist, and what agency can we get to be involved with this kid? And what we know is that that takes a long time. From referral to action <laughs> or interaction is often probably about at least a month. And then if it needs to be more specialty care, like an evaluation at Olsen Huff or something like that, that's three months at least. Psychiatry for kids, for instance, that's hard to get, especially you know depending on what their um, insurance provider is. And so, um, one of the one of the nice things is to know that you can do some things right now to help somebody sort of reset their nervous system, and then they can leave with a skill that helps them to be able to then do it again and again and again. And what happens is that as you can do that over over and over, just like going to the gym and lifting weights and working out, you're strengthening your muscles, you're strengthening your resilience. Um, so anyway, so that's what resources for resilience is. And it's really funny. There's some there's actual research that says it says it takes an on average 17 years for something to go from data to like to application in the general population. So frustrating. So, um, and it's true. It's like, so the ACE study, the original ACE study, took place in 1996. It's 2019. Goodness, I, can't, I just can't fathom why it's taken so long to get this information out to the general public. But it was originally done in partnership between Kaiser Permanente, which is like Blue Cross Blue Shield in California, and the CDC. And what, uh, the reason that it sort of evolved was out of one of the co-investigators, Dr. Vincent Folletti, who is an internist and was running an extreme weight loss clinic um, through Kaiser, was um, noticing, and this was people that needed to lose hundreds of pounds, like really extreme weight loss. And he was noticing that his patients that had the most, um, that were losing the most weight, like having the most success at losing weight, were also falling out of the program, gaining all the weight back and more, ending up in, in the hospital in the psychiatric ward, um, starting not 
what he expected. You know, he thought if they lose the weight, people will do great. You know, that's it. And what he started to, so he started to try to figure out what it was. And he didn't really have any reference point whatsoever. So he just started interviewing these patients and asking them a bunch of questions that a physician might ask a patient. So like one of the questions he asked was, at what age did you become sexually active? And um, a couple times he got, he mixed it up, um, not on purpose, and said, at what weight did you become sexually active? And the patient, then two, two, at least two of the patients responded something that you wouldn't expect, like really low weight, meaning very young. And one, the, the quote is, it was at 40 pounds and it was with my uncle or something like that. It was pretty, and he was like, he was shocked. He'd already been in practice for many, many, many years. And he said, it was like the second time I'd heard about sexual um, abuse. That long of a time, so this is how hidden this stuff is, how much people do not care about their trauma. So he started getting curious, like, how many, who else? And so as he started getting curious and asking more questions, it kind of honed in on childhood trauma. Sexual trauma was one of them, but it was a lot of other things also that were factoring in that all these folks had um, had experienced. And he was saying in particular with the, in the weight loss arena, it had, um, what, what was happening was when people were losing weight, they, the weight was protective in one way or another for them. And so once they lost the weight, they no longer had this protection. And so they started um, decompensating is what we call it clinically. So folks tried to commit suicide, some, you know, started, one woman, if you ever watch an interview of him, he tells the same stories, that's why I can quote him really well. He said, one woman, she was like, I'm not doing anything, I can't figure it out. And they finally figured out she was sleep eating. She was getting up in the middle of the night and eating in her sleep and not, had no recollection of it whatsoever. And she was one of the folks that gained all the way back and more. And so then... So anyway, it's, just, it's an interesting story about how he came to this. And then so he goes to the CDC and he's at a meeting and he's like so excited to tell all these people about what he's finding. What does this mean? And they're all like, yeah, right. <laughs> you guys, you know, you don't have enough of an in, meaning like you don't have enough of a, 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 of a number of people that you've surveyed or researched. This doesn't tell us anything. You need, you need many more before we're even going to think about listening to what you have to say. But there was somebody else there who is um, Dr. Anda, who um, was also in his own work coming across this and getting really interested. And so they decided to work together. So they, they created the original ACE study that had 17,000 people. And that's a pretty good end for a research. And so what they found was that um, there was a stepwise um, increase. So ACE, okay, let me back up a little bit. ACE score is 0 to 10. Everybody has an ACE score. It may be 0, and it could be as high as 10. You accumulate your ACE score from age, um, from birth to 18. Um, and so um, you can, depending on when you're counting ACE scores, you may still have capacity for having a higher ACE score than you do. Um, but anyway, what they found was, because what they were doing was sort of retrospective, they were interviewing adults about their childhood experiences. Um, so, first of all, they honed in on ten different things. And they were, um, let me see if I can get them, I always get like eight or nine. <laughs> and there's one I forget. But they were five types of um, abuse. So there was physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, um, physical neglect, and uh, maybe psychological neglect. And then there was, and then there was five types of household abuse. So those five weren't aren't that foreign to think. Oh, that might cause some kind of outcome in adulthood if you if, if you experience those things in your childhood. But the tendency was to think that would cause mental health issues and more likely to use drugs and more likely to try to commit suicide and just to have, you know, different kinds of mental health problems. What they hadn't really looked at what before so much or um, focused on were five types of household dysfunction. 
And those were um, anyone in the household, so it didn't have to be a parent. It could be an uncle that lived with you or somebody else, but the household. Um, that if there was anybody in the household who was a substance abuser, anybody with a mental health diagnosis, um, d domestic violence, in particular, they, in, at the time of the study, they were looking at um, a, a, a mother figure, whether it was a stepmother or a biological mother or whomever, that was um, treated, that was, that was um, suffering physical abuse. So exposure to domestic violence, ultimately. Divorce, separation. They call it divorce, <laughs> like everybody gets married. But it's actually ultimately, it's about not having a biologic, one of the biological parents in, in the household, whether they ever were there, or it, whether they died, whether there was separation, whether there was divorce, but somebody's not there that helped to create this being, is how the original one. What was the other one? See, I got nine. <laughs> so let's see, it's substance abuse, mental health, exposure to domestic violence, divorce, and um, there's one other. Anyway, what's that? De I mean, you'd think it would be, but it's not. It's then we'll talk about how they expanded the ACE study because they're like, yeah, there's more to this, obviously. Um, oh, prison. That's what it was. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. Having somebody in the family or in that in the household who had been or was in prison. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, you could score zero to ten. And what they found is that with your score, with every click of higher score, you were that much more likely to have certain kinds of outcomes. Um, so in, in adulthood, if you look way down the road, you see all these kinds of chronic diseases that we didn't necessarily relate to trauma, that didn't make sense in that terms, like diabetes and chronic um, col col the <sighs> coronary artery disease, COPD, autoimmune disease, certain types of cancers. Um, the list goes on and on and on of all these things that you wouldn't, you know, hear and say, oh yeah, that's, I bet they, they, I wonder if there was childhood trauma. <laughs> there wasn't any kind of like connection there, but what they found is there certainly is. And with every score, your likelihood gets higher. And then once you hit six, a score of six or more, you're, you die, the p people die on average 20 years younger. And when you hear anything about ACEs and statistics and all that kind of stuff, it's always in comparison to somebody who has a zero, a score of zero. So somebody with a six or more dies on average 20 years younger than somebody with zero. Right? And that's kind of a scary thing to hear. Um, and the way that in the ACE study they helped to sort of frame this is that they have a pyramid. Um, and on the bottom of the pyramid are the adverse childhood experiences. And then the second layer talks about how it affects brain development and it affects um, social development, basically. So what, what's really interesting to get into is that, you know, one of the things um, when we live in toxic stress environments, so like if these things happened, um, outside the home, but the home was a safe and secure place, then more than likely it wouldn't um, have the effect over the long run that ACEs do. The main thing with ACEs is that they happen in the home, and the home's supposed to be safe, and the home and the people there are, hope, are supposed to help mitigate or metabolize the effect on the nervous system that trauma has, all right? And because they can't do that because of all those things that are happening, then um, they aren't. Then that doesn't get stabilized. The nervous system doesn't get stabilized over time. And then over the long period of time, having that dysregulation in the nervous system affects all the other systems in the bodies. So um, anyway, you have that second layer that talks about the, how the brain develops and how when we are affected by stress and trauma, we go into fight or flight reactions, and our brain goes offline to some degree. Our, our big brain. The one that helps us regulate ourselves, control our emotions, control our impulses, um, and um, helps us to be able to learn, take in new information, and then be able to use it and apply it. And all the things that you hear about resilience, if you ever see a list of resiliency factors, um, they'll talk about things that require that your brain's online. 
And the fact is, the brain's not online unless, the, unless it's been healed, unless the traumas have been healed. So this sort of underlies a lot of the things that we talk about in terms of what resiliency factors. In fact, I, I assume that the, for big brothers and big sisters, the main thing is about having a positive influence in your life. Right? How, you are adding that factor. That's like the top number one resilience factor, is having an adult in your life that cares about you. And really what that does, ultimately, is it signals to the brain, to this threat detector that we have in our brain, that we're safe. And when our brain can get that message, it can turn off the stress response. And when the stress response gets turned off, the nervous system resets, right? So um, under, it's really important to get to kind of understand all of that that's behind because a lot of times we think, um, for instance, in the school system, we think, you know, we know this ch kid's got a really difficult situation at school, at home, but at school it's safe. So I don't know why they can't, they're not okay at school, why they can't settle down at school and be okay. They don't, you know, but it's because their brain's not getting the message that they're safe, whether they're safe or not. So one of the things that we actually teach in the, in the reconnect model is how to signal, how to get the brain to get that message, how to speak the language that the brain speaks in order to receive the message because our tendency is to speak our actual like words language and that's not what the part of the brain that's, that's always scanning our environment for threat or safety speaks or understands. So, um, all right. So hard for me to do this without slides to help me frame what I'm doing. But okay, so you coming back to the yeah, thank you. <laughs> good thing none of you've ever heard this before. Do you want to put your laptop up and just turn around to yeah. look at it? I then you, yeah, and then you can at least That's keep your outline sorted. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I started talking about the pyramid, and I don't actually have it on here, but. Um, So in the pyramid, then you look at, so you look at average childhood experiences, how it affects the brain and how it affects how the brain develops, so our ability to be in relationship, to be connected, to stay online, to control, like all those things that I was saying. And then, um, and so kids that don't, that have the toxic environment, those things aren't happening for them. So then they go to school and they can't learn and their social behaviors are not conducive to <laughs> being received by other children, um, so they're, they're sort of pushed away or outcast or, you know, people don't like them. They don't want to be friends with the kid that's dysregulated and poking everybody or can't sit still or is causing problems or is fighting. Or the other thing that happens with some kids is they completely shut down. And they're not causing problems, but they're not, like, here open to the world to be available for relationships. So what, re, regardless of what's happening there, it affects social relationships. It affects how they show up in the world. And that affects then how they learn. Um, and then as they get a little bit older, they find that there, some, some people do, not all, and this is not crucial in the outcomes of ACEs, but some people start to discover that there's things that we have and we can get access to that make us feel better like marijuana and nicotine and well just sugar I mean that's probably the first thing that we, uh, we get a hold of um, and then and then maybe perhaps harder drugs as they get older but as you kind of enter into those teenage years where there's just more um, ability to get a hold of those things then people start to use those and you can see like that teenager. then as you get up <coughs> then the next thing is on this pyramid that I think they've added to it now because they finally recognize that the traumas of oppression and intergenerational and historical trauma underlies everything. That's like where you start. Um, but as you get up here, you see that, that people start to um, suffer from maybe the chronic disease or again, these social things that have never developed well. They can't, once they get old enough to get out into the world, they can't get a job. They can't hold down a job. Relationships are not healthy. They get into relationships that you know, that it can be volatile, or at the very least, they're not helping that person to continue to mature and to, to be a healthy person in the world. And then ultimately, you get to the top where you have that early death. 
Um, so that's the heavy yeah, <laughs> stuff, but that helps us to understand. It, it's really kind of, in a way, the good thing is that we now that we know this, what can we do about it, right? We know, we can start to know what our ACE scores are for ourselves, we can know what they are for the people that we serve, um, and just in, in, in general we can know for our communities, we can actually get ACE, um, there's ACEs data for Buncombe County, for Western North Carolina, for North Carolina that we can look at, so we can get public health information about ACE scores and understand a little bit more about traumas that people are experiencing in their lives. Um, so, Inf information is helps us, right? Once we know something, we can start to look at what we can do about it. But at the same time, the one of the cautions is if you're going to talk to somebody about ACEs, you want to talk about resilience too, like I had said before, because it's heavy information. You guys might be calculating. You've probably figured out what your score is. You may have already known because you've already had these conversations what your score is. You might be thinking about your own your littles and what their scores are and what that means for them in their life if something doesn't change or if maybe it's already changed. Um, so what I would ask you to think about for a moment is just to think about if it's for yourself, what's gotten you through? Um, what got you through? How did, God, how did you get here today? What are the things in your life, the strengths or the people perhaps? There was somebody. <coughs> And then maybe it's also if you're thinking about somebody you else. Did it. Yay! Oh, <laughs> what got them through? <coughs> Yay! <laughs> um, so, what if if you stop and think about that? What are some of the things that come to mind? Like, what do you see that's been helpful to get people through? Close friends. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sports. Uh -huh. Hobbies. Yeah, being part of gardening. a team, maybe. <laughs> Hobbies, gardening. Yeah. One of the things about, I like the, the idea of sports in particular, because there's this team, right? And what, are we, what we know about like gangs and stuff is that people are just looking for connection. Yeah. And it's a, the, the gang is a connection, but it's not a healthy connection. But on sports teams, there can be really healthy connections. And not only that, but when we get fight or flight energy trapped in the body, sports help us to release it. Um, I just we just had a big we had hosted an ACE summit at at Mayhek, and um, <laughs> in true Asheville fashion, I started the opening plenary with the drumming with the the guy that <laughs> Larry McDowell that leads the drum circle downtown. I had him come in and lead the audience of like 300 and some people. And drumming, because drumming is one of these group things that people do, that there's actually data that shows that it has an effect on our nervous system. It reduces inflammation, which is one of the things that toxic stress causes. Now, is it the rhythmic? It's a, lot, it's a lot of different things. So part of it's the com connection with other people. Um, but it's also, if you just did it on your own, it would have an effect. So part of it's moving. So again, there's this fight-flight energy gets stuck in our body. And we need ways to get it out, so sports are really good for that. Drumming is another thing that helps to do that. And then, um, so it's also the connection with other people. It helps to release negative emotions because you're kind of doing something. And if you're thinking about a, um, a negative experience and you're doing something four minutes long. She did a whole 60 minutes on, um, on trauma and trauma, being trauma-informed and resilient. And she talks about her third grade teacher, Mrs. Duncan. <laughs> she says, I don't like that. I love Oprah. Um, who, because you know, Oprah has a really high A score. I don't know if you know that, but she's got a, a pretty intense trauma history. Um, I don't know what her score is exactly, but there's sexual trauma, um, domestic violence. Um, I'm not even sure what all of it was, but she talks about how important Mrs. Duncan was for her and her life. Um, so it's often a teacher, and now with big brothers and big sisters, this concept, then that definitely c it is a potential resilience factor for somebody, a strength, something that helps to get them through. Um, so should we try and see? The issue with this is still going to be the sound, right? It might play. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to give it a try. Is 
If your mother had a drinking problem when you were growing up, are you more likely to suffer from depression as an adult? Here's what you should know about ACEs. ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences, extremely stressful events that can happen to a child growing up. Some experiences are so stressful that they can alter brain development as well as the immune system increasing the risk of lifelong health and social problems in adulthood. The term comes from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, landmark research that shed new light on the root cause of everything from stroke and liver disease to substance abuse and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up. tallied up 10 different kinds of adversity in this largely middle-class and college-educated population. They were stunned to see how common ACEs were. 21% of all respondents were sexually abused as children. 19% grew up with someone who suffered mental illness. 28% had been physically abused. And two out of three respondents had experienced at least one ACE. The researchers next looked at how someone's ACE score, or the number of adversities they experienced, related to a wide array of serious health and social problems. They saw that the more ACEs someone had, the greater their risk for poor outcomes compared with someone with no ACEs. Someone with an ACE score of four had twice the risk of heart disease and cancer. Someone with an ACE score of five had an eight times greater chance of being an alcoholic. And those with an ACE score of six or more, on average, died 20 years earlier. With every major problem they looked at in the ACE study, the risk went up for each additional adverse experience in childhood. As Dr. Robert Anda says, what's predictable is preventable. It's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. ACEs are a tool for understanding the health of a population as a whole. For individuals, an ACE score can be a tool for understanding their own risk for health and social problems and empower them to make changes for themselves and their children. ACEs tend to get passed down from generation to generation and are common across all income levels, races, and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co.
that was just in that clip. She didn't talk in this clip at all, but she was in, um, in it. And um, she talks all about um, ACEs and her experience with them and gives really good understanding of the science behind ACEs. Um, it's really good and really helpful. So, um, the one thing I do want to talk about with you guys is this. So now, however, I'm going to go back here and expand on the trauma thing. Because we don't want to get stuck in that that's it. <laughs> Those are the only thing. I mean, it would be nice if that was it, but it's not. And we need to, we just have to know that there, you got to be able to expand the lens about this. And so anything that a person perceives as life threats has the potential to traumatize. Okay. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But ultimately, it's in the perception of the individual. Um, so it's possible that two children, for instance, that are in the same home during the same domestic violence event um, have different, one may be traumatized and the other may not. Um, a really good example would be like one of them runs out of the house and down the street to grandma's house to get help, but the other one stays and is not able to do anything. So the one that runs down the street is able to do something. That's a fight or flight reaction. That's actually a defensive response in which the energy fuels that, was able to do something and release in the action of doing. And so um, they're less likely to be traumatized by the situation, whereas the child that stayed and was unable to do anything um, is more likely to have um, be traumatized, which just means have symptoms of trauma. So um, once I talk about, the, expand on the definition a little bit, we'll go back and talk about how that affects the nervous system. So it's a perceived or actual event or overwhelming circumstance that produces intense fear or helplessness. Um, we talk about stress too, we don't want to leave that out. And a lot, if you ever, if you do talk about trauma, it's, um, it's always nice to say stress too because a lot of people don't respond to the word trauma, even though they have it in their past. They don't think of it that way. <coughs> they can they can digest the word stress a little bit more easily than trauma. It doesn't really matter. But stress can have this effect on us as well. It's sort of the cumulative effect. And certainly, like I talk about this in workplaces, that when we have too much to do at work, for instance, and not enough resources to help us do it, we can be, it can affect our nervous system is what we should say, in a way that shows up in some of the same ways that trauma can, but maybe not in, in as an extreme. Or if we've had trauma that's unresolved, then it can affect our nervous system in a bigger, um, more extreme way. This is a um, man that does a lot of work now on trauma, and this is just the definition that he talks about. That Trauma is a wordless story our body tells itself about what is safe and what is threat. Or trauma can cause us to react to, to present events in ways that seem wildly inappropriate, overly charged, or otherwise out of proportion. So assuming that the littles that you're working with have experienced trauma, you've probably seen um, with them or with other people. Just anytime you see an, a reaction that does not fit what's happening, it's trauma. Whether it's no reaction, you just found out that somebody died that's very close to you and no reaction, or really big anger over somebody looking at you funny, or something like that. It doesn't fit, then it gets going in, down the trauma channel. He talks a lot about racialized trauma, and his book is really in, intense um, and needs to be heard, but it's hard for a lot of people to hear. Mm -hmm. I thought about white, like white supremacy culture and 
and how that's affected, how it affects our whole society. But so that this slide gets a little bit to that at the uh, at that final that last column over there in terms of trauma of oppression, and just that now in in the ACEs field we are really starting to talk about this and address this issue, and they've added it even in the CDC they've added that to the pyramid underneath. So it's it's um, historical trauma and inter intergenerational trauma, racialized oppressions, and then you get to adverse childhood experiences, and then the things that I talked about before. Um, so, <clears throat> backing up a little bit on this slide, in the column about big T, these are what we tend to think of when we hear the word trauma, right? War, natural disasters, violence, big, you know, big time, big violence stuff, like mass shootings and that kind of stuff. So these are the kind of things that in society we, we think of when we hear trauma. Um, but there's a lot of other things that can cause trauma or cause a person to be traumatized. So the little t are things that we don't necessarily think of but have a pretty profound effect on our nervous system. So being bit by a dog, being chased by a dog, it's a prey predator scenario and it has the potential to traumatize us. Um, cause, so I've said this a few times, I'm just going to go ahead and say it because it won't, it makes more sense to talk about it now. When we feel threat, when we sense that we are in danger, we mobilize our threat response. And that's fight or flight. You've probably all heard of fight, fight or flight. And the way I talk, think about it is it's the gas pedal in the nervous system and it floors. It's not like, oh, it's going to be low energy to deal with the situation. It floors. Big, big energy goes into the system. So we can run faster, fight harder than at any other time in our lives. Um, and so if we can, like I was talking about in that scenario, run, fight, do something, it's not always a physical action, but if we can say something, we protect ourselves, defend ourselves, stand up for ourselves, even that helps to release that energy, if you will. Um, then, then we come back into what we call our resilience zone. Um, that like releases the energy, it burns the gas, right? Um, but when we can't fight or flee, then we go into another survival response. It's called a freeze. And the freeze is the brake pedal. But it's the brake pedal floored over the gas pedal. Like the energy went into the system for fight or flight initially. And then when the system, the brain determined you can't fight or flee, and we have absolutely no control over this. Um, no conscious control of it whatsoever. Then when the brain says, nope, you're not going to, uh-uh, you can't fight, you can't flee, let's shut down, slams the brake down and stops everything. And it's called a freeze response. And the freeze, like the perspe perceptual experience of a freeze, things slow down. It's a huge endorphin dump that happens. So you get, it, you get this self-anesthetized state. Have you ever been injured and not realized it until later? That's part of a freeze response. It's protective. It even slows down the heart rate so you're not pumping out um, too much blood. It's, there's a lot, it's really pretty um, elegant, <laughs> the whole design of our, the human body or everybody. Anyway, it's really impressive and really fascinating. But so the freeze is there to protect us gets us through. We get, we if you, the perceptual experience too is like feeling like things slow down. So a lot of people have been in car accidents, right? Like, I don't know, half of it, the population basically. So you might have had that experience in a car accident where everything slowed down. Um, part of the reason for that is so that you can actually see what you need to do to escape. If there's going to be another opportunity for escape, then you're going to see it because you're hyper aware and hyper focused on what happening around you. Um, and then it also, you just kind of feel like you're watching stuff, watching it, watching yourself, like a movie of what's happening. So that's that endorphin thing, and it's, take, it's taking you away from the pain, the, the, the emotional pain or the physical pain or both. Um, so the freeze response is good. It's protective. We need it. We see animals do it. We call it playing dead or playing possum here in the South, right? And then what we're, what we're supposed to do once the threat has passed is the body has to get rid of that. It didn't get to get rid of it in a fight or flight response. So all that energy went into the system and the body needs to release it. And what's supposed to happen is that we shake it off. We literally shake it off. And if you've had this, you do. You've not, it's not a little shaking. It's to come out of some life and not um, be overwhelmed by them. 
what happens in childhood toxic stress is that they, kids can't release that energy on their own. They need the other. That's why we're social beings. We need our, our others and our parents in particular help to set our nervous system and help us to metabolize the extra and excess energy that gets stuck there. So when you have an envi a home environment that's not able to do that for whatever reason, that energy gets stuck in the system. The energy also gets stuck in the system because we, for, for various reasons, we shut it down. So when adults have this experience, or um, just it, 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 when you're a little bit older, you're not like a little kid, and you have an experience of something traumatic happening and going into a freeze and coming out and your body wanting to shake it off will often stop it because it feels out of control. We don't like it. And, um, and so we'll shut, and we also, I mean, we do it in medical places. They, they, you know, we help stop that from happening when it's actually what it needs to happen. Um, my, I always give the example that I was, um, I was in a bus accident in South America when I was 18 that rolled off the side of a mountain in the Chilean desert. And um, so my brain was like, yep, you're going to die. <laughs> Went right into the freeze, and there's different layers of freeze, and it was in what's called a death preparation lake. And I, and I totally remember all of those things, like um, everything slowed down, and I still remember my leg going up over my head as my body like went out of the seat that I was sitting in. And I remember thinking, you know, it wasn't hysterical or anything, so it's huge, that endorphin dump. Everything was slowed down, and I was like, oh, this is too bad. <laughs> and is it going to hurt? And my mom's going to be really upset. But it wasn't, I wasn't hysterical. There was no, it was just like, oh, shoot. <laughs> Bad decision. <laughs> and then when, when, uh, the, when it stopped rolling and, you know, several things happened, eventually I got out of the bus and realized that I was safe. And that's when the body needs to let go of the energy. Well, I wasn't completely safe because I was in a foreign country. I was by myself at 18, and I didn't speak the language. <laughs> <laughs> so when I started to, when I, I totally remember, I don't remember the shaking so much, but I remember crying and starting to, like, really cry. Mm -hmm. And then I remember going, oh, no, girlfriend, you better stop. Me, you know, <laughs> stop. Because you don't, you're not safe. You're not, I remember thinking, you don't know these people. You better just control yourself. <laughs> so I stopped that energy from releasing in that moment that it needs to. And so what happens is it stays in the system. And here, I'm going to go back to this other slide. It. And, it di and it becomes, it dysregulates your nervous system. So um, this really helps to frame what I'm talking about. That's what I'm going to find it here. So we, um, we, we have this idea of the resilient zone. So that's this green area in the middle. And um, when we're in the middle, that's when our brain's online in the way that we need it to be so that we can just deal with life as it comes at us. If we have a challenge, then we can think through our options and make a, a decision based on a rational thought process. Um, if something's happened and we're really upset, we can control our emotions. We can feel it. It's not about not feeling, but we don't get stuck in it. We can ride the waves, basically, of whatever it is, emotions or stuff that's happening around us, and be okay and not stuck. But when we have um, trauma, it can dysregulate the system. So what this means is when that energy didn't get released, it didn't get shaken off or metabolized by help from others, then it stays in the system, and it causes it causes either to be stuck and amped up, so that's that gas pedal floor, too much energy in the system. So you can see that things like hyperactivity, not being able to sleep, not being able to set down, settle down, being fearful, feeling like something bad's about to happen all the time. Um, so any and there's a lot of different things, but just thinking about that in terms of too much energy in the system. If some of the littles that you work with have problems with, if they've been diagnosed with ADHD, and they have problems with focus and attention and concentration and hyperactivity, it's more likely that <coughs> than the true ADHD um, scenario. They're, it's really often misdiagnosed, but you know, anymore, I think it's important to understand that, but 
we can still treat it similarly, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter ultimately. But we need to understand that it's trauma because we have we can help to heal that instead of labeling it something else and not treating it how it needs to be. Okay, so you can stuck on amped up, too much energy in the system, gas pedal floor, or stuck in shut down, which is the energy went in, right? But it's a brake pedal dominant. Not the energy is not available in the system. Can't get to it. So can't you don't have the energy to get up and go and do the things that you need to do. Um, go to school, be around people that help you to feel better. Uh, might be really tired and fatigued, and then it can even it can be depression. Um, but it doesn't have. We don't have to label it. We don't have to give it a clinical diagnosis. But it can be. So some people get stuck there. Some people go back and forth between the two because. Brake pedal forward, I mean, sorry, gas pedal forward, brake pedal forward is both. And that's <coughs> really the true definition of post traumatic stress disorder, if you're familiar with that. You've got the highs and the lows the hypervigilance, high energy stuff, and then the numbing out and the low stuff. Um, but it can, again, it doesn't have to be diagnostic. Um, but I hope that helps to frame it a little bit. So that's why we can be traumatized by a dog chasing biting us because we mobilize our threat response and if we aren't able to get away or we're not able to defend ourselves and then also like if we get yelled at afterwards instead of received and nurtured then that can be that can become a trauma on that same slide were um, medical procedures <laughs> and it, why don't we do some pretty horrific stuff to people and we don't have to. We could really do things in a trauma-informed way in our medical <laughs> places and dental. Um, and a lot of people have, have trauma from these experiences. Like they'll talk about their childhood experiences with something that happened and they had to go to the hospital and they got held down while some procedure was done. And 50 years later, I'm a therapist, 50 years later they're talking about it. We're finally kind of getting honing in on on that as being one of their um, original trauma things. Stuck in the nervous system. This is fun, you guys. I never <coughs> skip around slides like this. We're getting <laughs> extra special <laughs> experience. Okay. So then you have all those things um, highlight like humiliation and rejection because that's like we are wired in our DNA. We need people. So even though it, this day and age we can actually survive on our own, our DNA doesn't know that we're wired, we need our tribe, we need people. And when we're pushed out, it can have a traumatizing effect because our life is in danger according to how we're wired, right? So that's why bullying and rejection and humiliation can be so profoundly, it can affect us so profoundly. Why like when in love relationships, when when you break up or somebody doesn't love you anymore that that can that people want to kill themselves or that the, you see really intense reactions to that that's why because it's life threat on some level to our being it's perceived that way and then you have the ongoing so the eighth is poverty witnessing to witnessing violence and witnessing scary things living in a neighborhood perhaps where that's dangerous um, and then we get to the traumas of depression that, that didn't come up in the A study, like I said already. And that's a whole um, thing to consider on its own. And But we really need to allow for that because what we've heard, um, we, and we're trying to um, address more is that people of color are saying, if, you don't, if you're not talking about this, you're not talking to me. You're not talking to my experience. And so we need to be talking to people um, but there's not just, it's not limited to race, um, culture, gender, sexual orientation, disability, religion, class, socioeconomic status. So basically, if there's something about you and how you show up in the world and you're not safe in certain places or in most places because of that, that can have a profound effect on your nervous system. Right? So these are, this is, this slide's about historical trauma. And we're already the eighth state. So what I want to do next is talk about, well, um, what can we do about it? So I already 
talked a little bit about the brain, um, but it's helpful to understand that this sort of model, this really easy model of the brain, and the idea that um, there's we, we think about the brain in three parts. The brain is very, very um, uh, sort <laughs> intricate. Okay. Complicated, <laughs> like the most incredibly complicated and thing <laughs> in our universe, probably. Um, so this is a really simplistic way of thinking about it. <laughs> it's called the triune brain, and we just break it into three parts. And for the purposes of understanding this, that's all we need to do. And so we have the survival brain, the, the emotional brain, and the thinking brain. The, and then in this picture, you can see that the survival brain is down here at the base, where it's where the spinal cord comes up into the base of the skull. And the survival brain is in charge of keeping us alive, right? So it does all, it takes care of all the things in our body to keep us alive on a daily basis, all of those systems, right? So it's the autonomic nervous system, the autonomic nervous system governs all the systems in our body, our breathing, our respiratory, our cardiovascular, um, digestion, immune system. So don't those all sound familiar from those outcomes of ACEs that we talked about? Cardiovascular disease? autoimmune disease, digestive stuff, all of that stuff. So you can see, start to see where this meets. Um, and then it's in charge of all of the survival responses, the fight, flight, freeze, submit, collapse. So freeze, it, the submit, collapse are on a continuum with freeze. Then you have the emotional brain, and that's where, um, that's sort of the middle <laughs> area. And um, it, it, it is in charge of memories and especially really powerful memories. So traumatic memories are going to be really powerful too. And so are positive ones. They're there too, but they inform <coughs> this one part of that of the emotional brain that's called the amygdala that is like the threat detector or the smoke detector, the way we think about it. And it's in charge of scanning the environment all the time for safety or threat. People that have had a lot of ex a lot of trauma that's unresolved, their smoke detector is huge and super sensitive. And ultimately, what that means is their amygdala is wired to everything. It's got a connection to everything, so it's getting input all the time, and it and it reacts to things that as it gets triggered easily when there's not a threat. So it perceives threat often when there is no threat. Um, so it's a, that's an important piece to know about this, is the emotional brain. And then the thinking brain is our big brain. It's our, where, it's our cognitive brain, our neocortex. We, have, it's sort of, we point to it as being up here where executive functioning is in charge of that kind of stuff. So like I said earlier, being in charge, feeling like we're in control of what we're doing and saying and thinking and the decisions that we're making and where we can take in information and where we can be in relationship with other people, that we need that part of our brain to be driving the car or online. Right? When we, we use this hand brain model to help understand it, I'm just going to go through it really quickly because I'd rather spend more time on the resiliency piece. So the survival brain being this part of the hand, all right, this is like the spinal cord coming up. If, if this would be how the brain would be, the hand brain would be sitting in my head, all right? So this is survival brain, this is emotional brain, this is the amygdala, and then this is the neocortex, or the thinking brain. And when it's online, the thinking brain's here, and you can see what's really cool actually about this model is that my fingers that are part of the thinking brain are touching the emotional brain and the survival brain. And really in a healthy, integrated brain, all three parts are working together. There's a lot of connection and wiring between all of those parts. And when there's been a lot of early trauma, that wiring didn't happen and that connection didn't happen. So, um, so that's important and helpful to understand. But what I want to say is that when the amygdala senses danger, whether it's there or not, it sends a signal to the survival brain to enact the threat response, to mobilize it. And so when it goes, when it gets that message, this goes offline, it gets it out of the way. And so then we're not able to, we're, the idea is if there's truly a threat, we don't need to go, what should I do? Should I, you know, you see a bear in the woods, should I run? <laughs> Should I climb a
has not gotten the message that they're safe again when they are safe. In the moments that they're safe, there may not be safety at home, but there may be safety at school, or there may be safety with their big brother or big sister. And we need their amygdala to get that so that they can strengthen their resilience and be able to, to lessen the effect of what's going on at home over time. All right? Um, so, all that said, let's just get to... So what that speaks is the language of the nervous system. The language of the nervous system is not, oh, it's, you're safe here. There's no, you know, there's nothing going on at school. You're safe in your classroom. Don't you like your teacher? Don't you, don't you have any friends? Don't blah, 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 blah. Um, and maybe there, there is, there is safe, but the, the amygdala hasn't gotten that message. And the, so we have to speak the language of the amygdala. We have to speak the language of the nervous system. And the language of that is sensation. It's how we feel in our body. Um, and so um, what we do in, in the reconnect model is we help people notice that and elicit it. So there's not always a sense of safety in the body. Um, So um, basically what we're trying to do is start to notice when, if we are safe, then how do we notice that in the body? So that'll be neutral sensation or pleasant sensation. And we sense into it and that signals, that tells the amygdala you're safe. It's the sensation of neutral or pleasant sensation. And it, goes, it gets that message and it sends a message here to turn off the threat response. And when that gets turned off, the brain comes back online. And then we can talk about whatever. <laughs> we need to talk about rationalize. So like um, if something has if there's been a behavior that's not okay and there need to be consequences, this is not the place to talk about it because they can't hear. And all you're doing is throwing gasoline on the fire. But if you can help to settle the nervous system, signal the, to the amygdala that there's no threat, brain comes back online. Now we can talk about that behavior and what the consequences are, if there are. I do a lot of training in schools, and they do not want you to take the consequences away. <laughs> okay, and then we're more accepting of whatever the consequence is, right? But when we're here, we can't, and we're just going to get more defensive and more dysregulated. Right? So uh, um, being able to notice when we feel safe or create a sense of safety is really helpful. So when I'm talking about sensations, we're talking about physical feelings, not, not our emotions. We do have sensation tied to emotion. So like if you think about when you feel happy, think of a time recently that you felt happy <laughs> or joy or something along those lines. What did you feel in your body? What ha when you feel happy, what does it feel like in your body? Relaxing. Relaxing. Like, mm -hmm. So calm, muscles. Calm. Calm. Yeah. calm. Mm -hmm. Open. Openness. Uh huh. So openness might be like I can breathe better. Mm -hmm. So that's all. That's sensation. That's what we're looking for. You can still be happy and joyous and whatever that is, but bring it down. Bring it from here down to here into the body so we can really get that messaging and speak, speak the language that we need to. So we're, that's what we're looking at. And we spend a lot of time in the training getting people like focused in on the body to get them oriented towards what these things are. But you guys kind of get the gist of it. Um, so we're looking at that, not, sensa not um, emotions, not feelings, but where it is, where is it in the body, <coughs> muscles, um, you said, somebody said relax, breathing, feeling more open, so it's, one of the, it's actually one of the first things you'll notice if you're doing this with yourself, you'll notice that when you've gotten really stressed and you come back into that resilient zone by doing this or something you already do, because this is not new technology, this is just kind of noticing how we take care of ourselves in a different way, that you take it that's helping to release some of that energy and settling into that um, re resilience zone. Heart rate slows down. 
Um, and then sometimes when you start to get a little bit more aware, you'll notice the warmth um, or coolness. As long as it's, again, neutral, pleasant, that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for negative. We're good at negative. We are experts in negative and noticing negative. And that's part of the problem, ultimately. But it's not something we can change necessarily <laughs> because we need it to survive. And that's why we notice negative. But we're looking for neutral or pleasant sensation, so vibration too. Um, and sometimes when you first, when we're first trying to get people oriented to this language, it's like really too foreign. So we just thought, like, do you notice anything different? And where? Is it in your chest? Is it all over? Is it in your belly? You know. So some people can say, well, yeah, I can't say what it is exactly, but I notice it's in my belly. Um, so that's what we're looking for. These are just some. These are just some examples of words that you could use. It doesn't, actually does not matter. It doesn't matter if you can find words for it or not, as long as you're paying attention to it. Because it's the attention that helps to reset the nervous system, and ultimately that's how we we re, rewire our brains is through attention to sensation. So these are the sensations that help us know whether, that we're coming back into our resilient zone and that we're actually sometimes releasing some of that stuck energy. Whether it's just stress from the car ride over here and every single red light, or it's just stress that we've been holding on to a long time, we can release that. We can notice it as it's leaving our body. So I can notice, I'm, I, am I red? I feel like I am. So that's my body is releasing a little bit of stress energy of like slides and you know whatever. And I actually had had performance anxiety all my life. I'm a lot better, but I still get a little bit of it. So this is just my body re re letting go of that little bit of extra energy that came into my system, and it's coming out through heat. So that's one of the ways. Um, vibration or tingling. So you can remember what I was talking about shaking. So it's not always the big shake. <laughs> Especially if it's not happening in the immediate aftermath of something big. But when when we start to release energy, we will feel tingly. And I guess one of the things you'll probably notice the most is getting that um, chills, like the you know chill bumps. Oh, that gives me chills. You know, and that's the body releasing energy too. Um, trembling, burping, yawning. So I told this this kid I had in my office the other day would not open his mouth. So I said, okay, I'm just going to tell you. I'm just going to give you a little education about trauma. And so I told him all this stuff. And at the end of it, he was yawning and yawning and yawning. And I was like, well, somebody else might be offended. And I'm like, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> you are releasing energy. This is good. <laughs> And then tears. Oh my gosh. That's probably the way we do it the most. And we so try to stop it and shut it down and make it not okay. But even just getting, just tearing up or getting wetness around the eyes um, is releasing energy. So sometimes, you know, like you listen to, you hear something on the radio and it touches you and you kind of tear up. That's just that your body got a little bit of a bump of something good from what you heard, and it said, let's get rid of some energy. <laughs> and it does. So when it happens, let it go. And give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> so sensing in is one of those things that we teach people to do. And it's just about noticing. So if you don't, and, and we don't have, I can't teach you the whole model today at all in this resiliency stuff. But I'm thinking about what you could do a little bit for yourself. So here's the thing, I know we can, I keep talking about the littles, and you're here to hear about this to apply to the littles and the folks that you work with. But if you actually just use this for yourself, then two things will happen. One is that you just be more present in a way that is it, that being able to be available for connection um, helps to settle the other's nervous system, even if you're not doing it in any kind of overt way at all. If you're present, solid, and safe, individual that can have a calming effect on another person's nervous system. But then also if you take this and use it for yourself, it'll just come really naturally to share it with somebody else. Um, so again, sensing it is just this tool that's paying attention to neutral or positive sensation. Don't 
noticing where that is in the nervous system. There's um, research that shows that 20 seconds of attention to that helps to rewire the brain. And so um, that's not a very long period of time. We have, like I was talking about earlier, the, what I didn't name it as such, but it's called the negativity bias, where we pay attention to negative. Um, and the reason we do is because that keeps us alive. It's um, survival. But what we do with negative is we pay attention, exquisite attention to it. And if it's like a negative <coughs> sensation in the body, we're like, what is it? Like, what's going to happen next? So like, say, I've got a like my stomach hurts or something, I'll be like, what is it, what does it mean? Am I going to get sick? Am I going to start throwing up now? Am I going to, you know, am I going to have to leave? Am I going to have to, somebody else is going to have to do my presentation? And all of us, you know, we start doing this thing that just amps it all up. And meanwhile, we're like, what does it mean? What's happening now? <laughs> well, we don't do that with positive sensations. We don't go, so good. I wonder if it's going to help me relax the muscles in my neck. Maybe somebody's going to give me a hundred dollars. <laughs> you know, we don't do that at all. <laughs> and so, me, so we have this idea of the scale of positive and negative, and that when we're resilient, it, or it's our scale tipping towards the positive. But the problem is when we pay so much attention to the negative, it it makes the negative way more. So what we're saying is, even though we, we can't get rid of a lot of the negative, we can help people not pay so much attention to things they don't need to. But we, if we pay attention to the positive in the same way that we do the negative, we can neutralize it. Start to neutralize it. Start to tilt it at least back up, maybe, into the middle. So these are just a couple slides to just give you an idea, to, to give you a moment to practice. So when you see this slide of a mama and a baby, how does your body respond to it? What do you notice on the inside? And it won't, and it's not always positive, it just depends on your, depends on you, but what, anybody want to share what you notice? <laughs> it's like pure joy, I guess. Yeah. And so is it like a can you is can you connect to a sensation of joy? That like you're feeling in response to it? Like not physically no, just, What's not, that? Not physically. No, yeah. Okay, so that's the challenge though, yeah. is to start to notice it physically. Because we do. We just don't we just so not used to speaking that language. But to just start to notice that. Like even that if you notice that you smile when you see this little baby. The awe response. Yeah, yeah. That then start to just try to connect it to a sensation. The this one might have a different response. I feel like somebody messed with a color on it. <laughs> But what is, how does your body respond to that? Deeper breathing for me. Mm -hmm. Like a relaxing of the, just sort of like sink in the chair a little more. Yeah. Uh -huh. <coughs> I get a smidge of an energizing because I'm yeah. really curious. It's like this perfect little, you know, get there, uh -huh. go check it out. Uh-huh, and yeah. you're smiling. Yeah. yeah. So you got a little bit, bit of the energizing, pleasant yeah, energy, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 So this, so this is the thing: is just to start to notice again the body's response to things, positive or neutral. All right. So, um, in terms of what would be most helpful for you all. Do you find like what do you what do you think would be helpful? What do you, what are the issues that you bump into with the kids that you work with in terms of behaviors, and in terms of maybe um, some of the things that they struggle with or that you see that um, you're struggling to get it to, to connect or like that? I think maybe like at least for me like a tool 
or skill that would help maybe in a moment of stress mm -hmm. um, it, to really address that okay. then and there. Mm -hmm. I think that would be helpful. Anybody else, those kinds of things sound like they'd be helpful? Because that's actually what this said. The rapid reset is a set of things that can help. So I'll tell you about them. And, um, and so the, the idea is that this gives sensory input like into the system in a, in, without having to engage any part of the big brain. So one thing might be movement. So if you have a, a kid that's gotten, uh, you know, is reactive and there's lots of energy in the reaction, then movement is helpful because the body needs to do something with the energy. If you tell a kid, what we tend to do is tell them to go sit in the corner until they're ready to come back to be part of the group, right? Um, and I'm not talking about you guys, but it just that in our society, this is what we do. <laughs> sit over there and get yourself together, and then you can come back. And the problem is we don't do that well on our own, especially if it hasn't been taught to us and internalized already. And then we're also... Part of the issue is all that fight or flight energy is in the body and it needs to fight or flee, it needs to move. And so walking, and it's not like you, you, we don't all walk, but we have to walk and pay attention to walking. So when we, fight or flight energy actually goes to the arms and the legs. And so <laughs> moving the arms and the legs and actually like going for a walk, like if this kid, um, if you can be like, well let's just go, let's go for a walk right now. Let's just walk around, or let's go get, if, I mean, I don't know the settings that you're in, but if it is something that you can go walk somewhere, then let's go walk. But what you want to do is start to have them notice the walking, if you can. It's just be like, oh, so one of the ways you can do it is be like, oh, dude, did you get new shoes? Or how, are those shoes comfortable? Or something like that. Or you can just say, notice, can you notice your feet? I just want you to pay attention to your feet as you're walking, so you're noticing the shifting of the weight from one foot to the next. Um, and, I, and depending on the age, they may, little kids, kids like this. They like moving because, when, again, when we sit and we're activated, it just it gets worse. So moving is helpful. And if we can bring attention to the movement, that helps even more to get, the, to get it out of the system. In the schools, they'll often get a kid who's gotten dysregulated in the classroom to go for a walk to get some water at the water fountain. And have you ever noticed that we do that a lot? Like when somebody's upset, we give them something to drink. Mm -hmm. Like, here, have a sip of water. I'm going to make you some tea. Something like that. And part of what happens when we, so you'll see on here, taking a sip is one of the rapid resets because it's part of this sort of mindfulness type of practice where if you pay attention to the water or whatever it is that you're sipping, as it hits your lips and goes into your mouth and down your throat, you're signaling to your amygdala where you are in space and time and that it's not dangerous. Because usually the reaction is not to something that's happening now. It's most likely something that happened in the past. Sometimes it's about something in the future but that's informed by the past. So I would almost say it's almost the past. But anyway. And so the brain's acting as if this thing is going to happen now or, or is happening now. And so when we take a sip and we notice it, it tells the brain where we are and that that thing's not happening now. And so it has a calming effect on the body. So you can do the movement, the walking. One of the most powerful things, but it's a little bit weird, is pushing on a wall. And you can push on a wall because see here I'm using my arms and my legs. And I'm going to push this thing over. If it's really big energy, that will help. But, um, so, and you can do it this way, too. You can push, because I can push with my arms and my legs here right now. And if I was doing this, you would, it hadn't told you, you wouldn't know what I was doing. You'd be like, gosh, I wonder if her back hurts. You know? <laughs> but it wouldn't be really weird if I was doing this. But it, if I was feeling really anxious or something, it would help to reset my nervous system. If we have a kid that's, like, really upset, We'll just do it with them. So I'm not going to make it, you feel weird and make you push on the wall, but I'll be like, hey, let's do this together. And for little kids, they'll be all over it. They don't need any explanation. Older kids are going to be like, well, that's weird. You can be like, just trust me. Let's try this together. Or we can do it this way. Or, 
you can also do a thing in the chair that they call it, the school they call it push pull dangle. They come into my office and I just say, let's just push on the wall and I'll do it with you. And one of my favorite um, times was this woman was like, <laughs> she really was having a panic attack when she came into my office. We're pushing on the wall. She's like, this is weird. <laughs> but it works. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, and in the schools, they like it so much that they put handprints on the walls and their calm corners and stuff so that kids can do it. Um, so it's a pretty powerful one. Singing <laughs> is a little bit, I mean, it really is cool and I love it in terms of like, again, these things that were sort of naturally um, part of our human existence to help take care of ourselves. I think singing is one of them, definitely, because when you when you sing, you breathe out longer than you breathe in. That's one of the reasons. And that pushes the break in the nervous system, the calming break, not the extreme free break. It pushes the calm break in the nervous system. It enacts the relaxation response. It also, so you're breathing out longer than you breathe in, you're vibrating all of the inner parts of your body. So your brain's noticing the body in the moment, and it has that settling effect. Um, so, but singing's not something you're going to be like, hey, let's sing a song together. <laughs> really weird. This is more like something that you teach people to use maybe on their own. Um, so, but kids love to sing, right? So this is something you can say when you're at home and you're feeling some kind of way, you can just turn up your whatever they turn up these days. <laughs> Put your headphones on and sing. Or, you know, so they can you can teach them how to, they can do this thing on their own. Because they almost all will have their favorite song. And they can try it. At least. So singing's a good one. Um, heavy work. That's that same idea. You're just getting something. So in the, again, I love the school. So this is the best. It's the best. We need to be doing this in schools. But in schools, they'll like give a kid who's like wired a bag, a box like that of books. And they'll say, here, we take this down to Miss So-and-so's office. <laughs> so the kid's got the same walking in. All this input, this proprioceptive input, is telling the body where it is, the space and time. A lot of people with a lot of trauma can't feel their body, so they need heavier and more input. So that's part of what this is doing. And um, they're tearing it down the hall. So they're getting all this, and their, body, and their system is settling. And then when they get there and leave it, the teacher's like, okay, here, now, can you take this one back to your teacher? <laughs> they have this whole system. <laughs> by the time they get back, they're settled, they're online, and they can be in the room. Um, orienting is something that where we teach um, just to look around. So how old is this kid that you work with? Ten? Um, so ten-year-olds will do this. Ten, you can be like, hey, man, tell me how many... <coughs> How, um, things that you see in the room that are green, or how many round things that you see in the room, or how many things that look like Minecraft. You can start playing around with it, but the idea is that you're getting them to look around. So whatever you're doing, how, whatever you're suggesting, the head and the neck need to move because part of our initial like trauma threat thing is to stop and orient to like if I hear. Um, a loud noise over here, I'm going to go and move to see. Is that danger or not? So when we move our head and our neck and we're looking around trying to see how many things look like Minecraft characters in this room, um, then I'm telling my brain there's no danger there, 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 and it's getting that message. With little littles, you can do, do you see what I see, or, you know, those kind of fun games. And with older pe older kids, you can just say, let's do it, this orienting thing. I think it'll be helpful to you. Tell me five things you see that are red, and four that are purple, and three that are pink, and what, it doesn't matter the color. Just, just tell me. And when people are really dysregulated, they're not like, oh, that's weird. They're like, help me. And they, they'll, they'll try, usually because they all, everybody wants to feel better. And they're all looking for ways to do that. And then the last one we teach is um, this. It's called a butterfly hug. And it has to do with bilateral stimulation. 
there's science behind all of this, as weird and random as it seems. There's science behind all of it. And this has to do with bilateral stimulation. And also, you're hitting um, acupuncture points here. Um, but you can teach this as a soothing tapping side to side. And one, of, and one of the kids that I see, she's starting, I just saw her yesterday, but she's starting to see a counselor at school, which is a good thing because they can actually see them more often. And um, she said that her counselor had taught her this. And <laughs> so yeah, this is soothing, and it's kind of like there's a lot of different ways of soothing. I like to do it this way. It doesn't hit those same points, but this is like a hug, and it's containing. And you know, if you think back to babies liking to be swaddled, and that can, that's all about their little nervous system and helping to regulate their nervous system. So hug, and then we also get an oxytocin release from that, which is a calming hormone. And soothing relaxes us. So there's a lot of different reasons why these things can be really um, effective as we are seeing. So when in your relationships, you just got to figure out. And sometimes it's helpful to teach these things before there's an explosion. So you could be like, hey, I learned these things. I want to teach you. So next time, um, something like that thing that happened last week happens again, we can try them out and see if they help. So then you can say, Right, you know, walking and noticing that all our weight shifts from one foot to the other, or pushing up against the wall. This is a really weird one, but it's cool, you know, whatever. Um, so, any questions? I guess these are these are strategies to put in place when you're amped up or shut down. But I would imagine just integrating these more in your life will allow them to be like the resilient state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, um, when you get it, it, and the other strategies that we teach are ones that are more like, here's a practice. You can use it in the moment, but let's practice these. The more you practice them, the more you widen that resilient zone, and the less you're affected by the things that. And actually, you know, I was talking about how this, the amygdala gets super big and sensitized, and those connections start to dissolve. The ones that are not needed, they're feeding too much into it over time, too. That's another way to think about it. Um, but even with just the sense in as a practice, if you, because I always tell people, and you, if you, I say, if you don't take anything else, just take noticing how I feel when you feel good. From this, from this, little time that we had together and even I say this in our two hour two day trainings and I say it you know with my patients if you just notice how you feel in your body when you feel good you will strengthen your resilience so if you can help them identify help them understand what that means what you're looking for and help them start to identify what those times are and then reinforce it by asking them about it over and over so it starts to become like an internalized practice 